observable right. things. And what about, well, I would imagine heat has to make those things, but what about instrumentation and yeah. other kind of measurements? Exactly, you got Michael. Don't forget the thermometers. Our prime basis for making the prediction is that when you add up all the thermometers of the world, they show you unequivocally it's warming. How many are out there, just roughly? Thousands. 10,000? Well, there's a problem. Come on, i got to be a scientist again. On goes the, the caveat hat. Some thermometers in the middle of cities, and cities heat up not because of global warming, but because more people using more energy. Some thermometers move from the middle of cities to airports, which gives you an artificial cooling trend. We have to correct for that. We do. We're not a dumb community. Uh, they do that very, very carefully. And these so-called urban heat islands, which the op-eds in the Wall Street Journal will insist are responsible for the hoax of global warming, absolute nonsense. You can run the earth with or without them. You still get roughly the same warming. So we use the thermometers. We use satellites, which can measure the thickness of the atmosphere. Okay. That's consistent with it. Plants in your grandmother's backyard are blooming one to two weeks earlier now than they did half a century ago. Birds are coming back earlier from migration. There's multiple lines of converging evidence. Glaciers are melting all over the world. Multiple lines of converging evidence is a fancy way of saying very strong preponderance. You better believe it's pretty likely. All right, I believe it, especially when I reflect again back on what Chevron's position is that global warming is happening in Exxon. Okay, I'm with you. And the third, and we're, we don't have too much, what's the third fact that you? Well, the third fact, we have to use a little bit of fact and a little bit of inference. Because just knowing that it's warming, how do you know we did it and it doesn't mar Earth? So you've got to separate out the part of that that's due to nature from the part due to us. You can't do that directly. You have to do it indirectly. So what you do is you have your mathematical model, our virtual reality, our partly cloudy crystal ball. Now, they're not perfect, but they do replicate many features of the Earth. You drive the model with only natural forces, sunspots, volcanic eruptions. You explain 10% of what's happened in the last 100 years. Now you drive it with greenhouse gases and dust and smoke, and you explain 40%. Now you drive it with the combination, you explain 60%. Right. This is not an accident. This tells us it's very likely that at least since 1975, humans are the primary driver of that big increase in global warming. Sure. Now, I just like to simplify this. I'm the common man. Uh, years ago, there was less of us on this planet, and we were doing less. There's many, many more of us, and we are using more and more gasoline, coal, and, and other things. And it only makes sense that we are emitting much, much more carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases up there. And I have a sense as to the effect that that has. So I think you use the term anthropogenic climate change, man-made climate change? Yes. So I'm with you. And I now would just like to. Uh, uh, so for me, the battle is over. The debate is over about whether climate change is happening or not. We're, we're at the tail end, and all my friends who believe in creationism, my religious friends, uh, they have the evidence now to start doing something to protect what God created for all of us. This is your book, your latest. Yes. And it's... Uh, Science as a Contact Sport. And, of course, I had to read it, and I found it very interesting. And I want to ask you, why did you write it? And what would somebody get out of this? How are we going to fix the problem? We don't know why it's broken. Why, if we knew 35 years ago this was coming, did I and my colleagues fail to yet get the rules that we need to try to protect our own atmospheric commons? And part of the answer is not nice. There are sort of three factors. There's us, we scientists. We tend not to always be articulate, and we lead with everything we don't know. And by the time we tell people there's dangerous sea level rise, they've gone to sleep. Then we have, and I've got to be blunt, the liars and spin doctors. And when you said the battle is over, it's not over for me. I'm spending four hours a day trying to deal with people who use phony arguments claiming it's a hoax with cherry-picked data out of context. And they are very effective because they count on the third element, the media, 
trained in political reporting, right? Get the Democrat, get the Republican. Appropriate in political reporting. In climate science, don't get a 200 scientist report that went through two rounds of review and then weigh them off against some not so enlightened oil company funded petroleum geologist who says it ain't so and give them equal time. That's not balance, that's ultimate distortion. The average person says, well, if they don't know, how do I know? So what we have to do and what I wrote the book for was to tell the history of why we should not be bamboozled by people selling us the north end of a southbound horse through neat, quick sure. refutations that are, in fact, not real. All right. I want to say, again, I'm the common man to an extent. I couldn't do this interview with you if I hadn't acquired a considerable amount of knowledge from your book. And I recommend the book for everyone. It shows a tremendous history of the fight to help educate us about a development that threatens the creation. And now I'd like to make two statements. Uh, the painting behind you is climate change. And I, before I read your book, just reading newspaper articles from the Wall Street Journal, from uh, uh, the New York Times, and listening to news reports, gave me the feeling that climate change was real. And that development motivated me to make that painting, which basically says people are going to fly out of the sky, our cultures are going to die, some people are going to be washed away by waves, others are going to be fried like eggs. And now I'd like to make one other statement, and that is uh, environment, the art exhibition that Arabella Decker and I are involved with and will open in Half Moon Bay on November the 14th. And I hope everyone has an opportunity to come over and see. That painting isn't going to be there, but a whole slew of new paintings that she and I have made to provide, to motivate people to gain new insights into the environment. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest has been Stephen Schneider, and I am Michael Hillen. <laughs>